would be if we did not use symbols. Shine your light. Now what's it talking about? I'm not talking about taking flashlights out and searchlights. It's talking about something deeper than that. Okay? So, so let, me just, let me just run off. Just, this is going to be a string of consciousness stuff with me right now. Okay? Just symbols that come to my mind and they come to my mind that are found in Revelation. Christians are called priests in Revelation. Now our image of a priest in our culture would be someone who wears no collar, a white collar, black suit, etc. Priests back in those days was not, didn't focus so much on what he wore, but what he did. A priest was a servant of God. Okay? Or take, for example, when the church is called a lampstand. Why would the church be called a lampstand? Well, because in Zechariah chapter 4, Israel was called a lampstand. The church becomes a lampstand. Now, why was Israel called a lampstand? Because when God called Abraham and called the descendants of Abraham, he wanted to be a light to the nations. He wanted to be a blessing to the world. And so, the lampstand is used to describe old Israel. The lampstand in the book of Revelation is used to describe new Israel. In the book of Revelation, prayer is likened to incense. And you know, you get that image, don't you? That's easy. You like the incense, and what did the incense do? The incense is sins. Our prayer is the sin to the presence of God. Or take, for example, Every image, every image for the church in Revelation comes out of the Old Testament. And the bride is part of the Old Testament. The church being portrayed in terms of two witnesses. Do you remember the book of Deuteronomy? If something was to be established, it was legitimate, how many witnesses did it take? Two. How did Jesus send the disciples out? Two by two. In the book of Acts, Peter and John. Book of Acts, Paul and Silas. The book of Revelation, the church is symbolized by two witnesses. In the book of Revelation, the church is symbolized by, uh, by, uh, by, by, the, uh, by the word church. The word church is a symbol for an assembly, for a gathering of people. Hell. Well, what's hell going to be like? Well, hell is going to be a place of torment, of uh, unending pain and suffering, of uh, darkness and gloom and doom. But let me tell you, hell's going to be worse than those. Because John is trying to describe the agony, the, the, the terror in language, in language that people can not understand. If hell is going to be so much worse, heaven is going to be much better than streets of gold and pearly gates. He uses language to communicate the richness of a relationship with God, and he uses language to, 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 to emphasize the, the, uh, the darkness of separation from God for all eternity. Uh, let me give you this illustration. Back, I think it's right around 2003, 2004, C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was released in the movie. And uh, if you've not seen the movie, if you've not read the books, you may want to leave because I'm going to give the ending away. Uh, uh, I, I went, Mary and I went to see it at Christmas time. Really loved it. And uh, I decided to go back after Christmas vacation and then I wanted to see it by myself. I took a pad of paper, a little flashlight, I wanted to write down some of the dialogue. And so I showed up on a day that I thought surely nobody else will be here. Well, that day in Springfield, some schools, some Christian schools that let their kids out to go see the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. <laughs> Parents were with their children, and, and hundreds of kids were with me. <laughs> hundreds. I was sitting in the back, and two little girls were sitting right next to me, and their mother was on the other side. Now, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the witch is a symbol for Satan. She's evil. Okay? The lion is Aslan, and he is a symbol for Christ. Okay? In the movie, we're watching the film, and there's a scene in the movie where one of the children had betrayed, them. recall the story, and Aslan dies for the children. It's a powerful scene. 
Ashland, remember, submits himself to the wicked witch and her henchmen. His mane is shorn off. He's killed. The woman of these two children, Mom, looked at me, and I had tears roll up in my eyes, because it's such a powerful telling us the crucifixion of Christ. The woman, and it, her little girl was glued. And the woman looks at me, and I look at her, and the woman said, I can't tell you what she says, because you couldn't. I should repeat it. She said, what the is going on here? I said, I'll tell you later. Well, a few scenes later in the movie, do you remember what happens to Ashland? He's raised from the dead. And the woman says to me, what the blank is going on here? <laughs> I'll tell you later. Movie comes to an end. This is in Springfield, Illinois. Movie comes to an end. The two little girls and the mother stay, and the woman says, what is this story about? I said, have you ever been to Sunday school in church? No. I I'm assuming the children do, because Christians, we think it's a good thing for our children to have some religion in their background. We've been taught that it's a good thing to have some moral values. I said, I said, no, I didn't roll my eyes at her, but I'm thinking, oh, no, no, no. I didn't roll my eyes, no, I didn't do that. I said, I said, do you know anything about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? She said, no, not really. And so I had to take time to explain to her that Ashland was a symbol for Christ. And that when Christ, Ashland, dies, he dies because of the betrayal of Edmund. And then Christ is raised from the dead, after he's raised from the dead, and the wicked witch is destroyed. But Bob, she didn't get it. Because she didn't have a context for the movie. See, we don't get the book of Revelation if we don't have the Old Testament context. And so we can read all kinds of things in the stories that John is telling. But if we know the story that he's reading his story in, well, we don't understand his story. Am I making sense today? And so I, I could take every chapter in Revelation as symbols. Wally and I were talking about during, during the break time as we were walking out. Well, look at stop signs, road signs. They're symbols, don't they? Aren't they? They don't say, do not enter. There's a sign with the red X to it. Yield signs, stop signs, etc. Merge signs, etc. Symbols are kind they provide direction, they provide guidance, they, they provoke, they evoke, they, they bring out emotion. And so you need to learn to read Revelation as a symbolic book. And when somebody says, is it only symbolic? Oh, it's more than only symbolic, it's powerfully symbolic. Because imagine a world in which you remove all symbols. I, I can't imagine that. Can you? I mean, we, there's just not a world that exists without symbols. Smell, sights, sounds, touch. So I'm repeating myself, because I believe repetition is the mother of wisdom. If you want to know the meaning of these symbols, you go to the Old Testament. And then you discover that John sometimes modifies those symbols to fit his message. But there's a core, there's a core meaning. Well, let me illustrate it this way. Look at Revelation chapter 9. Let me read, read Revelation chapter 9. Let me read to you just a, just a handful of verses. Let's start with chapter 9. Jumping right in the middle of the trumpet will be blowing. Verse 1. The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fall from heaven to earth. He was given the key to the shack at the bottom of pit. Uh-oh, I saw a star falling from heaven to earth. Now let's interpret that that literally happens. Remember what we talked about earlier today? If one star fell to the earth, what's going to happen to the earth? It's going to be destroyed. So we've not seen a literal star fall to the literal earth, and this literal star then is given the key to the shack of the abyss. It must be symbolizing something. I'll talk about it in a little bit. He opened the shack at the bottom of pit. And the shaft rose smoke, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. The sun and the air were dark with the smoke from the shaft. And then from the smoke came locusts on earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. And they were told not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green plant, or any tree, but only those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. 
and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. And then in appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. Their heads were, were looked like crowns of gold. Their faces like human faces. And hair like women's hair. And their teeth like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the noise of their wings was the noise of many chariots with horses rushing to battle. And they have tails and stings and like scorpions. And their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. And they have the king over them. The king of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek he is called Apollyon. Abaddon means destruction. And Apollyon means destroyer. And you look at that and I'll ask you a general question. Are these creatures good or bad? Okay? We at least have on that. They're bad, aren't they? We hate to meet them either in a movie or in real life. They are bad. Now, what's John describing here? If I want to know what John is describing here, what do I need to do? I need to see how those symbols are used in the Old Testament. Symbols like bottomless pit, symbols like smoke and sulfur and scorpions and locusts and five months. I need to trace those. Now here's where you have to trust me. You can take my list back of the book and you look these passages up. Let me tell you what John described. Look, he gives a hint to it. In chapter 9, verse 1, look. He was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit and from the shaft rose smoke. Look at chapter 9, verse, verse 11. They have his king over them. The angel of the bottomless pit is named in Hebrew as a bat, and in Greek he is called a polyp. Do you know what the word a pit means? What the word pit means in the Bible? It's the abyss. Now play with that image. You ask me about resources. If you look up pit, pit, and if you look up uh, abyss in the dictionary of biblical imagery, here's what you discover. In ancient times, that was a symbol for the dwelling place of demonic power. A dwelling place of demonic power. And what John is describing there is the demonic power that is allowed to rise on this earth and to inflict great pain on people. Now, notice, remember the, the there's a reference there three or four times to five months? To five months? That's the lifespan of a locust. In ancient times, the locust lived five months. Now, what did locusts do? Locusts were creatures of devastation. They were used as a symbol of judgment. They were used as a symbol of evil. Here's what John, here's the big picture of Revelation 9. John is saying that as we live in this world filled with evil, we live in a world filled with demonic power. But it's saying that it only has power for five months. What does it say about that big extent of demonic power? It is limited. It cannot ultimately have control of God's people. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? It does not mean that we will not suffer. It does not, but it means that we will be victorious over the forces of hell. You see, one of the things I'm going to bring to you next week, please come back next week, if you would, because I want to talk about what John, how John tackled the issue of the nature of evil in our world. A problem in my culture, in your culture, is we do not know how to understand evil. We want to psychologize it, we want to analyze it. We don't want to acknowledge its reality. Right? Oh, if he would have only been better educated, he wouldn't have killed 13 people. If she would have only done this, she would not have done this to her children. I want to say, my God, don't you know there is something called evil at work in this world? But what John is trying to communicate, evil is atrocious, it is horrible, but it is limited. It will not have the final word. So John uses these horrific images. I mean, Steven Spielberg cannot come up with something so hideous looking as in Revelation 9. So I don't interpret this literally. I interpret symbolically in the sense it's symbolizing the very forces of hell unleashed in our world. Don't we see them present? But no, we try to rationalize it. We only have more law. If we only do this or if we only do that, do you understand that laws can only do so much? 
You understand that tanks and weapons and bombs can only do so much, John says. I mean, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 6, what John writes in Revelation, our enemy is not flesh and blood. It is principles and powers. So how do we fight principles and powers? We bomb the hell out of them? No, we fight with love and prayer and faithfulness and hope and endurance and purity and righteousness and with a proclamation of the word. That's how we fight evil. But how do we talk about evil? You're in a place with physical. I'm not saying you're isn't. But evil will only be destroyed by the power of God, is what John said. Pretty powerful stuff. If you understand those symbols. So does John see helicopters? No. He sees something worse than helicopters. Does he see nuclear bombs in Revelation 9? No. He sees the forces of hell unleashed in our world. So for the first coming, the final coming of Christ, evil still exists, doesn't it? Christ has won the victory. He, he is mighty to save. But that salvation will only be complete and perfect when Jesus Christ comes again. In between times, there will be loss of life. There will be casualties of war. Are you, are you connected with me? Symbolism evokes and provokes. It's memorable. Okay, so John has this book full of symbols. But I've got to move to one final point in the time that we have left. But before I move to that point, I want to see are there any questions or comments? Yes? Um, the creatures you described in Revelation 9, are those actual creatures or are those just symbolism? It's symbolism. It, it, there's never a horse that looks like this horse. There's never a locust that looks like this horse. It's like John just brings together from the Old Testament all these descriptions of locusts and, and wicked creatures and everything and he puts them together and says evil to take on the world. It's powerful. It's awesome. It's horrible. Yeah. So you're not going to have some day someday with, 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 uh, with a breastplate of iron with horses' heads and women's hair and all that. No, no, don't look for that. It's talking about the power of Satan at work in the world. Good question. Okay. Yeah, man. Good question. Am I making sense to you? I am. That's good to hear. Because see, how old are you? See, I get nervous because I saw you sitting up here because I get very nervous when I teach young people. Because I think I can't. I can go do a very good job communicating with them. But I'm making sense to you. Okay, you're a sharp young man. I'm getting laid ahead. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Okay, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, very good. Anything else? What are you going to take home with you? At this point, what are you going to take home with you? Meaning, you know, just key points. This is not a time to pat Bob on the back. It's a time to say, I want to know what you're taking home. Know the Old Testament. Huh? You better know the Old Testament. Good. What else? The Book of Hope. It's Book of Hope. Don't be afraid of this book. You can still get the big picture. There are particulars that I will wrestle with until I die. <laughs> But I can still get the big picture. I can still get the big picture. I understand. Here is the map of the picture of what John's writing. What else you think about? Book to obey. Pardon? It's a book to obey. It is a book to obey. Every, every section, there's a call to obedience. Some way you it, either explicitly or implicitly, we're to be obedient people. Okay, even chapter 9 that I just read from, even when evil is unleashed, what should we be doing? Be faithful, regardless of how much evil seems to be winning the other hand. We still are faithful to God. What else? Anything else? Just take it home. Yes? Learn from Scripture enough from people. One of the scariest things that I have in writing commentary is making sure that I don't make mistakes in the commentary. John's book is the only one that begins with the old with with the warning. The only book in the New Testament says, if anyone adds to or takes away from this book, God will add two plagues described in this book. That is rather scary. That you want to make sure that when you preach or teach this book, you're doing it as accurately as possible. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. 
Are, not do not ignore it. Do not ignore it. Do not afraid of it. It is as relevant as Romans is or Philippians is. So don't ignore it. Don't be afraid of it. Good. Anything else? Let me move over. Let me move over this one. Yeah, it was a book written uh, to each of us. It was a book written to the church corporate, but it's also a book written to each of us individually. You see, each message in chapters 2 and 3 begins to the church, to the church at Laodicea, to the church, to the church, but then it closes to the one who overcomes. I will give to that one. It personalizes it to the one who overcomes, which means we're involved in the battle individually. The church will always be victorious. The church will, I mean, the church will never be defeated ultimately. But individual Christians can fail in their walk with Christ. They can fail to be overcomers. Anything else? Yes? I like the, yes, the thing about you was uh, like the Bible study situation where you've got different opinions and how, uh, you know, I'm kind of gracious to say it's so multicolored and everybody has their own opinion and it's gravity and that's what you want to know. Yeah, because we live in a culture which we don't want to we don't want to offend people. But you know, there are some things I've heard in Sunday school class, quite frankly, they're heresy. That's just false teaching, pure and simple. It cannot be right because it doesn't come up with another path in scripture. So we've got to seek it. Sometimes what we have to learn to say also is this, I don't know what this passage means. And I'm not afraid to admit that. There are certain passages of Revelation that I do not know. I have just written up the commentary on Revelation 11, which in my opinion is the most difficult chapter in all of Revelation, chapter 11. It is one tough chapter. And it's going to go through considerable revision before it's ready to be published. Because I want to make it accurate first of all, but I want to be clear. And so, so you can read it and say, okay. But there was a few times I say, this may mean this, or this. But it's not a major point to decide if it means this or this, because either one can be legitimate, given the context. One last point down the study guide. If you go to the final point, the structure of the book. Now, I talk this away. I need, I need to share this with you. Okay? I need to share this with you. Open to Revelation 6. Revelation 6, please. I got an email the other day from a person I do not know. And they visit my website because I have a website with which I respond to people's questions. And this person sent me this email and he asked me this. Bob, have you ever looked at the material that so-and-so has developed in his ministry called End Time Ministries. A lot of people are wondering if what has happened around us today is somehow linked to events associated with the end time. If you're not familiar with this material, you can find it at his website, www.endtime.com. I'd like to know if what he teaches is anywhere near correct or if you think he's misapplied scripture. I hate getting emails like this. And so I visited this man's website. I'm going to read to you Revelation 6. And I'm going to give you his interpretation. Revelation 6. I'll come back to this next week, by the way. But right now, I just want to read Revelation 6, 1 through 8. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And they came out conquering the conqueror. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that men should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, the black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the one with life. Uh, by the way, what that means is a quart of wheat, for denarius means a, a small amount of wheat for a whole day's wages. It costs your whole day's wages to buy a happy meal. 
Okay, things are scarce, things are expensive. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked and behold a pale horse. And his rider's name was Death. And Hades followed him. And they were given authority over the fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. I will give you my interpretation of that next week. Except to say this. Here's what John is describing. He's describing military power and war and famine and disease and pestilence. So what period is he describing? He described what's always gone. For the curse coming to find God. I'm not saying, oh my, the rider on the white horse is coming out today. Or the rider on the red horse is coming out today. There's always been war between nations, hasn't there? There's always been pestilence. There's always been famine. There's always been disease and death. Why well, visit this man's website? Please don't get visited. You don't need to. Ah, what do these horses represent? The red horse. There is an international spirit in the church in the earth today known as the red power. Nations who embrace communism or socialism are known as red nations. Communist Soviets were commonly called reds, while China is also known as red China. Therefore, the red horse is the communist system. The black horse. The rider of the black horse of Revelation 6-5 had a pair of balances in his hand. Balances are a symbol of trade or commerce. What international sphere in the world embodies the message of commerce? Of course, it's capitalism. In political and news circles, democracy and capitalism are sometimes referred to as the black power. That is new to me, by the way. I have heard that before. But listen to the rider of the white horse. White is used as a symbol of peace. The predominant message of the Roman Catholic Church is the message of peace. Furthermore, Catholic policy dictates that the Pope dressed in white, his helicopter, Pope Mobile, and jet airplane are all white. If he had a white horse, what color would you suppose it would be? <laughs> you see what he's done? See what he's done? He's taking current situations and reading them back in first century text, which would have been meaningless to John's readers. And he's not looked at what the colors red, white, black, and pale came to mean in Zechariah's day, from which this passage comes from, by the way, and how John is using them as timeless symbols for hostility that's at work in our world. Okay? I mean, just one illustration by dealing with the internet that could be duplicated probably here in more Illinois while I'm some preaching. It's certainly on radio and TV this weekend. Now I need to move to the final point because we have about three, five, forty minutes. The structure of the book of Revelation. The structure of the book of Revelation. This is where I'm on page uh, four. Four. Now I'm going to read through A, B, and C and then I'm going to, I'm going to go into more detail. The structure. Revelation uses an intricate structure that I think enriches its message. The story that John sings makes repeated use of repetition and recapitulation, strategies that were well known to the age of people. And the Revelation uses a non linear approach to reinforce its message so that God's people dare not forget what has God has revealed. Now, this is maybe, this may be the toughest the toughest hour that I stood with you. Because a lot of people think that Revelation is a linear book. Now let me write this word up on the board. Let me define what I mean by linear. That Revelation provides a timeline that from Christ's first coming to Christ's final coming you have these, for example, seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. And as these seven happen in history, we check them off and say, we're that much closer to the end of the world. 
I would suggest to you that's not how Revelation is to be read. But rather what John does, he uses repetition to communicate the same truths. Now I'm going to introduce this to you today and then we will spend more time on this next week, okay? So you may want to take some detailed notes, come back next week with some detailed questions or listen to the tape or the CD or whatever you're going to put this on. But, 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 but I want to give you the big picture right now. John writes like a spider. He keeps covering events from the first coming to the final coming of Christ, but he's constantly bringing us to the end of the world throughout the book. He's constantly bringing us to the end of the world throughout the book. Let me illustrate it this way. Let me illustrate two or three ways. Number one, in a football game on Sunday afternoon, they oftentimes show a play from different angles. It's the same play, but they show it, maybe from an aerial view, from the end zone, from the side. It's the same play. Okay, right? A guy's running the football, crosses the goal line, and they and, and they, they just say, now, look at this move on his part from this angle. Look at this move. I wonder if that was a good call or not. Did his footstep out of bounds? Well, let's look at it from different angles. You're looking at the same play. What Revelation does, it looks at the history of the world throughout the book, but from different angles. Okay? Let me give you another illustration, how, how, how I can illustrate this. Uh, several years ago, I really got into... Uh, well, I'm not really into it, but I, I, I like to do photography. And I decided to take a photography class online. And uh, a former professor up in Bloomington Normal. And he gave an assignment. And I, I thought, this is a dumb assignment. <laughs> and then Marilyn stopped me and she said, have you ever wondered how often your students have said that about Here was the assignment. He wanted me to take 10 pictures of my mailbox. <laughs> the assignment was due, I think, on a Sunday night, and I waited until Saturday to do it. <laughs> I thought it was a dumb assignment. So I get my digital camera, and I go out mumbling, stupid son, ten pictures of a mailbox, it's thin on a stick, the box is there on top of the stick. So I get out there with my digital camera, and I take a picture. And then I get down on my back under the mailbox, I take a picture of the underside. And then I get a ladder. And I step off the ladder, I take a picture of the mailbox on top, on top. And then I open the door to the mailbox and take a picture. Then I go inside and get some mail, stick it inside the mailbox and adjust the flash attachment where I can take a picture of the inside of the mailbox. Now by this time, my obsessive behavior is taken over. <laughs> and I'm up to about, I don't know, 60 or 70 digit shots. <laughs> And Marilyn was trained, I think, that nobody will drive by <laughs> or that Jesus will come. Because I go into the house, and you have to understand my marriage with my wife is very secure. But one thing where we can really we can have words is if I get out any tools. <laughs> because I am dangerous with tools. She is skilled with tools. I am stupid. I went and I asked Marilyn where her cordless power drill was. <laughs> hers, not mine, hers. She didn't want to tell me. <laughs> I don't think it's charged. Marilyn, I just want to use it. For, she finally loaned it to me. I had to put the deposit down. And uh, I drilled a hole in the back of the mailbox and fed a line to the mailbox so I could put the camera up front 
because I didn't know when the mailman was coming to deliver the mail. And then I took the cord behind the bushes that are beside our mailbox, and I waited for the mailman to come to open the mailbox where I could take a picture of putting the mail into the mailbox. And so I, I mean, Mike comes, member of our church, puts the mail in the mailbox, I stand a picture, startles him, I think, is it an act of terrorism? <laughs> I, am, I come out from behind the bushes, that had to scare the kid. I mean, I feel like coming out of the bushes, you know, you know and say, Mike, Mike thinks, I, this is for a class assignment. And I said, would you mind getting out of the mail, out of your mail truck and hand me my mail by the mailbox? And he did, he, he was kind. And, um, and uh, uh, the, the point is this, I took probably a hundred different pictures of the same mailbox. But it's from different angles. John takes pictures of the history of the world from Christ's first coming and Christ's final coming from different angles. Okay? He looks at it through this lens, we'll see next week. He looks at it through this lens. And then he goes around and he's given another vision and God calls him to see the end of the world through this, this end. Let me tell you John's overall strategy. Here is his overall strategy. This is not your study guide, so if you're taking notes, you may want to jot this down and I'll review this next week. Here's John's overall strategy. John begins his book with the end of the world in mind. He ends his book with the end of the world in mind. And in every major section in between, he keeps the end of the world in mind. Let me repeat that. John begins his book with the end of the world in mind. He ends his book with the end of the world in mind. And everywhere in between, he keeps the end of the world in mind. He's put a salesman told me one time. Here is the key to a good sale. When he's trying to sell something to someone, you tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them. And then you tell them what you told them. In the first John, in the first chapter of Revelation, John tells us what he's going to tell us. The world is going to come to an end, God will reward, God will punish. And then he tells us in a variety of creative ways. And then at the end of the book, he tells us what he's told us. Okay? Now this is a radically revolutionary way for most of you to learn how to read the book of Revelation. But let me tell you something. This way of reading Revelation is as early as I've been able to trace it back. There were Christians who read the book this way in the second century AD. They, they said, John's not trying to give the history of the world in great detail. You know, this seal is going to be broken, and this seal, this trumpet is going to be sounded, and then we can just mark, you know, check off on a checklist of things that must happen before Christ returns again. You see, everybody who's tried it, remember the stack of books I brought last night? Everybody who's approached Revelation like that, what's happened to them? They've had to rewrite their books. They've had to rewrite their books. Because they've been wrong in seeing a fulfillment. Because that's where they see prophecy being primarily prediction. Prophecy is primarily description and proclamation. Now I've added something there to you. Did you catch that? Very subtle. Prophecy is descriptive and proclamation. Prophecy is description and proclamation. Prophecy describes the world in which we live and it proclaims to us God's will to how to live in the midst of this world that is being described in light of the future that belongs to God. I just gave you a mouthful. Let me give it to you again. Prophecy is primarily description plus proclamation. And the description of the world in which we live is found in the seven churches. There have always been those kinds of churches. There have always been the events associated with the seals happening. There have always been the events associated with the trumpet. They've always been going on throughout history. So I don't look for a check-off and say, oh, this has happened, so I know that we must be within a year of the end coming. 
That is a bogus way to read the book. The way to read the book is it uses repetition, recapping of the same theme over and over and over again. Question, why do you repeat yourself? For emphasis? Why else do you repeat your all oh, listen? I, we can have marriage counseling sessions as a result of that question. <laughs> I repeat because you didn't hear me the first time. I repeat because you didn't listen to me the first time. I repeat because you forgot what I said. You may have heard, but you forgot. Now, I'm not speaking to the husband or the father. I'm God speaking there. What does God repeat? Because God knows we have the attention span of gnats. We are prone to forget. And so John drives that point over and over and over and over again. To drive, to hit the nail, to drive it home, to make sure that we remember that lodges in our heads and our hearts. So let me help you lodge this in your head and heart. Look at Revelation 1. Look at Revelation 1. And you're turning to Revelation chapter 1. I, I, when I mentioned about our wives or our husbands or whatever, I, several years ago, I think it's 1999 or 2000, Marilyn and I went to Massachusetts where I used to live. It was a very rough time for us in our married life in, in Massachusetts. And we went there in 99 or 2000 to uh, revisit some old places. And it was when the movie The Perfect Storm had been released. The Perfect Storm is a movie that stars George Clooney. And it's about a fishing vessel that leaves the port of Gloucester, Massachusetts, goes out. And we used to live about five miles from Gloucester. And so I thought, boy, this would be a neat place to go see the perfect storm, where it was filmed, where the story actually took place. So Marilyn and I go to the theater in Gloucester, Massachusetts. <laughs> We've eaten at the Gloucester house. And, uh, and so we go there and we sit down and we begin to watch the movie. And about halfway through the film, I lean over to Marilyn. The storm is really building up now. And, and I lean over to Marilyn and I say, it's too bad they don't make it. And she said, what? <laughs> I said, nothing. <laughs> she said, what do you mean if they don't make it? Have you seen this movie? I said, no. So I've not gone. Well, how do you know? I said, it's, it's a real story. I've read the book. Oh, mercy. <laughs> what really frosted me was she she scooted down the seat and she took the popcorn with her. <laughs> okay? It was not a it was not a good time. We had had a rough marriage out here in 73, 75, and it just got rougher. Because I gave away the end of the movie. And I didn't help matters anyway. We were walking on the sidewalk and I said, Bruno, I said, I, I'm sorry. I said, but the Titanic sinks. There are no survivors. They all die in the hour. I'm just digging myself a deal. <laughs> you see, we like the suspense of knowing what? Not knowing. But you know what I confess to you? There are times that what about what did what, any of you do this? Or any of you ever tend to turn to the end of the book to see how the story ends? Now some of you do that. I know you do that. I know you do that because you get so captivated. You get so. Beginning, unless you have to leave early, church early. Look at Revelation one seven. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribe of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the A to Z, says the Lord God, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. At the very beginning, what did John say about the future of this world? It belongs to God. He's coming. And if you read the verses before that, the verses after that, you discover that what's going to happen when he comes is those who are his saints are going to be rewarded. 
and those who oppose him will be judged. Look at Revelation 22, the last chapter. Last chapter. Oh, numerous places in Revelation 22. Numerous places. Verse 7, Behold, I am coming soon. Verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Verse 20, Surely I am coming soon. John then adds, Amen, come Lord Jesus. So here, here goes. John begins with the end in mind, he ends with the end in mind. There are no surprises to Revelation. And then, every major section, let me give you the sections real quick, and we'll, we'll explore these in more detail next week. We're going to go a little deeper next week. Chapters 4 and 5 break the beginning of the book. Chapter 6 does. Chapter 7 does. Uh, chapter 11 does. Chapter 12 does. Chapter 14 does. Chapter 16. Chapter 18. Chapter 19. Chapter 20. Chapter 21. Chapter 22. The all to the end of the world. Over and over and over and over again. Let me give you two illustrations, okay? Turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Look what happens in chapter 6, verse 12. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky filled the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit and shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and item is removed from its place. And then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich and the powerful, and the slave and the free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks and the mountains, calling to the mountains of rocks, Fall on us. And hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of the wrath has come, and who can stand? Now let me ask you a question. Does this sound like any old day in the history of the world? On the surface, I'm jumping right in the middle of the passage. What does it sound like in describing? Is it any old Monday? Boy, we got off to a rough start this week. <laughs> what does it sound like to you? I'm, I'm not trying, to, I'm not trying to, to force it onto you. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who can stand? What's the day of wrath? What do you think he's talking about? Judgment day. We're not even a third of the way through the book. And John's brought us again to the judgment day. But let me give you even more evidence for that. The number seven is a very important number in Revelation. The number seven symbolizes completeness or totality. Okay? In other words, Bob, in the history of of the church, in the history of the world, Christ's first coming, Christ's final coming, the church is always going to be addressed in these seven churches. But they represent the churches to the ages. There's always going to be seals broken. There's always going to be trumpets blown. Bob, there's always going to be bowls poured. Completeness. Cultures come and go. Cultures are going to be judged over and over and over and over again. But all those judgments with a little J, are leading up to what? Judgment with a capital J. So look what happens in verse 12. I want to make a note here on something, by the way, that we'll look at more fully next week. Look at verse 12. When you open the sixth seal, I look and behold, number one, there's a great earthquake. Number two, the sun became black as sackcloth. Number three, the full moon became like blood. Number four, the stars of the sky fell to the earth. As the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. Number five, the sky vanished like a scroll. Number six, every mountain. Number seven, every island is removed from its place. Notice in verse 15, number one, the kings of the earth. Number two, the great one. Number three, the general. Number four, the rich. Number five, the powerful. Number six, the slave. Number seven, the free. Now, why would he have seven categories of creation and seven categories of humanity? Because when Judgment Day comes, who's going to be impacted? Everybody. Everything. He didn't have, he didn't have eight or nine things. There were eight or nine. But he has seven. He emphasized totality. And then he asked the question in chapter 7, verse 17, who can stand? 
I'll tell you next week who can stand in more detail. Who can stand that answer in chapter 7? The 144,000 can stand. Guess what the number 12 is associated with in the book of Revelation? People of God. Where does that come from? The Old Testament. The 12 tribes. The 12 apostles. The multiplication of number 12 said all of God's people will be able to stand. He's not talking about 144,000 literal believers being saved. It's a symbol. As seven bomb is a symbol here. He brings it to the end of the world. He brings it to the judgment day where they're going to experience the wrath of God. In chapter 7, Christians will experience the blessing from God. Look at chapter 11. Look at chapter 11. Now, before I read chapter 11, I've got to read two of the verses to you. We'll go back and read chapter 1, verse 4. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. Who was, is, is to come. Past, present, future. Chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, who is, who is to come. Past, present, future. Now look at chapter 11. Verse 17. We're brought to the end of the world again. Most of your Bible will read this way. The King James Version may not because it adds a phrase that it should not have added. Verse 17. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken the great power to begun to reign. The nations raised, but your wrath came in the time for the dead to be judged, for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying and destroying the earth. Question. Does that sound like any old day? What does it sound like again? It sounds like the day of judgment, doesn't it? But go back up to verse 17. There's a phrase that is missing. In the earliest copies we have of Revelation, not found, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. Do you see what phrase is not there? Who is to come? Why is it there, the original text? He's there. Because he's come. Because he's come. And so you may have a Bible who had that phrase, and your Bible ought to say the leader of manuscript of Revelation has added that phrase. But it's not found like in the earliest copies of Revelation. It's not found in the earliest copies because we're being brought to the end of the world. Now here's my point. Revelation did not read like a line history of the history of the world. Revelation gives the cycles of history that history is headed towards the world. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. And all the earthly kingdoms that come and go are leading up to the final judgment upon this world when God will come and glory. Am I making sense to you? Is that Questions or comments? Because there's a transition into next week's lesson when we will look in a separate, brand new study now in which we'll take a look then at this chart in more detail and we'll look at the seven churches and the seven students and the seven trumpets and the seven ones. But I have reached my limit of teaching at this point. I'm going to reward you by letting you out 10 minutes early because I am about finished physically teaching. Thank you very much for coming.